everybody's favorite chakra, the sex and sensuality panel, and um, it's usually the highlight, or at least the climax of the event. For me, that's why I tell everyone to put their phones on vibrate while you're here. So, um, really, just because. That's good. I'm on a roll. Okay, forget this panel. I'll just tell you my... Um, all right, where were we? I'm Alan Steinfeld, and I do a show called New Realities, and um, I think, really, seriously, almost, uh, seriously, that um, conscious sexuality and the understanding of who we are as sexual beings is a, is a revolutionary idea that began in the 60s, but, um, you know, in New York, there's some very conscious um, sexuality representatives here. We need to understand who we are. If we're any, going to do anything out there as physical beings, we need to incorporate all of ourselves. And we cannot leave out any part, especially one that's at the source of who we are, our, our sexual being. And that's why uh, Mark, I told Mark, let's do a sexual panel. And he says, yes, and we have some great experts here, and I'll introduce them. We have Jamie Summers, and um, what did you want me to introduce you as? The creator of orgasmic dance. The creator of orgasmic dance. Okay, let's give her. A uh, thank you, Jamie. And we have Lisa Corella, Corello, 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 Corello. And Lisa, what I love about Lisa, she brings such an innocence and purity to the most wild sexual ideas you can imagine. Really. <laughs> she is just like, you know, herself. And that's why I think it's so important that we can just be ourselves and um, not have it be distorted as it has been when we've been growing up in this culture. Great movie out called Don John, if you want to see like about sexuality in the modern culture. So that's Lisa. Nick Delgado is always um, an interesting guest. Okay. <laughs> no, you always have something to add, Nick. I, I, but Nick, Nick's specialty, I think, besides you know the mouth stuff you usually do, but um, is is the chemistry, the sexual physiology, and I think we should be talking a little. Maybe we'll focus on a little physiology uh, today. And next to Mark, we have Anton Diaz. Um, do you want your middle name in there? Richard Anton Diaz, yes. Sexy Spirits, and really, if you want conscious sexuality of any sort in New York, Sexy Spirits up on uh, 55th Street is a center that Anton runs where he brings a lot of uh, fresh ideas about sexuality, how to approach it, and and how to explore it, you know? And we need more institutions like that, so look up Sexy Spirits. And then new face on the panel today, let's go around, Layla Martin. And uh, she's, she's a tantrika, been studying tantra in India and around the world for a long time, and she's now set up residence in New York City to um, make people more sexually aware and sensually aware of their, of themselves. And, um, you know, unless we're enjoying ourselves, there's none of the stuff out there really means anything. We have to be really in our body and really loving our body um, in order to access the realms of spirit. It's, I think we're out of the time where we um, are just consciousness. We have to be embodied consciousness. And that's why a panel like this is a bridge from the kind of the social conditioning we have had out there about sexuality and some of the spiritual conditioning we've had out there. So we need to be both. We need to be embodied as conscious beings. So with that, let's just, um, you know what? We've been doing this for about, oh, there's Keela. She's on the panel. She's a, she's a pleasure coach and now she's taking off her clothes. I'm a coach, I mean. And she's wearing a lovely green dress with a bright red hair, with a, with a bow in her hair. And she's modeling this year's um, pleasure sensuality. I said, are you on the panel with us today? Yeah. All right, we're waiting. Okay. And um, so what I'd like to approach this panel with, at least to start, is the idea of sexual physiology. So we have, um, you know, we have a separate, almost separate system that is activated within the sexual act that innovates new nerves, new muscles, new tissues, and it sort of um, needs to be accessed. It's not just something that happens. It can be... Um, used and developed and explored 
in ways that you can't find anywhere else um, except from people who have explored that. I mean, it's not out there in the mass market, this sexual physiology. So that's a place I would really like to talk about. And um, would you like to start about talking about the woman's end of things? <laughs> about how, um, well, what gets activated within sensuality and sexuality that's not in our normal awareness and and how can we work with that? Is that a good or vague question? Yes. Okay. Sure. You, know, um, you know what I'm asking? Absolutely. Okay, good. Well, I can start from a female perspective in that there's lots of different nerves innervating the vaginal area, the uterus, and the different ways that they get triggered actually produce a tremendous different, like wildly different experiences in the female body. And in the last 30 years, there's been a lot of emphasis on the clitoral orgasm, which is an absolutely beautiful sexual experience. But there are so many different forms of orgasm and ways to be stimulated inside the female genitalia. It's mind blowing. And what I've come to experience inside my body and what I've seen in many other women's bodies is that there's different levels, different depths of orgasmic experience in the female body. And they're actually correlating this physiologically with the ways that the nerves actually innervate the different parts of the female body. And one nerve that I love to play with, it actually starts from the cervix and it runs directly to the heart and directly to the brain in the female. So oftentimes- What nerve is that? The vagus nerve. Okay, love it. All right. Okay. <laughs> and we can get very focused in the brain. So I'm a lot about the brain and orgasm, and orgasming in one particular way. So we get used to being touched a certain way. We get used to fantasizing a certain way, and that can be beautiful. So any path to orgasm, I absolutely embrace. But what I found in sexuality is that because orgasm exists in the brain, our brains are very plastic. So there's all these different experiences that we can experience sexuality in sexuality when we get out of habit. So I like breaking sexual patterns and sexual habits because it gets you out of your comfort zone and experiencing something that maybe you haven't experienced before. And what I like to think of is of the vagus nerve and the different pathways in female sexuality is you can do something very spiritual like take a 10 day meditation course and access different routes of communion with God, with spirit, with yourself. But sexuality has the exact same entry points as does something like a meditation retreat. So when you learn the different physiological pathways in your own body as a woman and how to access those different pathways, you actually find that you can start achieving orgasmic experiences through different pathways in the brain. And I found that different places in the female body actually can trigger more sparky sexual experiences, more activated sexual experiences, and other places, more in the cervix, more in the deep areas of the vagina, are like a super highway to spiritual communion. So it's like instead of just having one looping pattern of orgasmic experience, you could actually explode the entire brain. And instead of having to work really hard to understand things about yourself, about the universe, you can learn to use sexual physiology to open up uh, the different ways that you experience sexual pleasure. Wait, let me ask you one question. That's great. Wow, I love that. I was getting excited just to see. <laughs> Do it, but... Um, try and find something new. That's not always pleasurable. I mean, can be. You have to be expressive and understand. But also, it's not all always orgasmic. I mean, there, unless with you, because maybe everything is an orgasm. And then, I mean, are you talking orgasm like wow, or is it any sort of pleasure orgasmic? I mean, what's your boundary of orgasm? Okay, so this is an interesting topic in sexuality as well recently, which is that there's a climactic peak point of orgasm that people can experience that feels like, okay, I just started orgasming then and I just ended then. And there's been a movement away from that in the tantra world, in the, sec in the sensual sexuality world, into there's also states of orgasm that don't really have a clear start and finish, that can be just a continual orgasmic experience within the female body. And what I've also found is that people can make a judgment about one or the other. So there's been this movement away from peak style orgasm into experiencing moment to moment what's going on inside the body. Now that is tremendously beautiful, I found, because it takes people out of the mind and into allowing the body to give an or an organic experience. So you're not driving your body towards a certain goal. You're allowing your body to gift you 
whatever is its momentary truth. And there's tremendous value in that exploration. But I think all things that our body can offer us are sacred. So peak orgasm can be tremendously beautiful, and for a woman who isn't experiencing peak orgasm, it can be frustrating to say, don't focus on orgasm. But the female body is able to experience wide ranges of orgasmic peaks that can go on for hours. So wow. a medical definition of orgasm is too limited. Thank you, wow. Um, I'm gonna have some cold water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, Anton, why don't we talk about that from a male perspective? I would like to give a greater context because I was, and I'm thrilled that you chose physiology as an opening point. We've never really done that. And I'd, I'd like to talk about uh, orgasm, actually less about orgasm, more about sexual arousal, which sexual arousal could be seen as the activation of the body into the sexual act. And I love the idea of the physiology, and I'd like to give you something that you can immediately start looking at, and that is this, that any time we enter into sexual arousal, whether it's, whether it's uh, seeing someone one attractive, whether it's seeing an article that might turn you on, whether it's looking in a window and seeing a great piece of clothing that you like to buy, these are all parts of sexual arousal, because that's kind of the way marketing has been created. It's been created to unify what we'd like to buy with some kind of sexual connection. And that's, that's, in a way, very indicative of the power of our sexual energy. All our body knows inside, all our internal knows is that it's getting ready to create babies. It does not discriminate whether you're getting turned on to someone of the same sex, an article of clothing, a pornographic movie, a beautiful woman. It does not, it does not discern and say, uh, oh, this is that turn on, so we're going kind of, to kind of turn down the reproductive, re reproductive systems at times. And the point about that is that our body goes into the full mode of creating a brand new life, a brand new baby. So the body floods itself with the best possible hormones that are going to create the psychological and emotional condition for that birth. It creates all the borrowing of each of the cells from each of the organs to create this perfect, perfect cell. So when and if conception does happen, we have this perfect, perfect baby. And that's something very important to realize because if you begin to identify your whole sexual activation, how nature is employed in that partnership, we can begin to learn a lot of things about human behavior, how we relate with the opposite sex, and about our own sexual energy. We, we can begin to understand the emotions and the mental ideas that come around our sexuality, how nature rigs it so we get turned on to certain people and not turned on to others. So it's very crafty, intelligently, engineered a way to make the best selective choice for that perfect baby. So I think physiology is really, for me, at the root of the most grounded way to understand high-level orgasm. Well, the other part of that, and I know you know this, is that the most vital substance, the most precious minerals, at least in the male body, is pulled from everywhere else in order to make that sperm, because that sperm needs to be so vitalized, full of energy and life and, and the optimum chemistry that it's, it's just um, coalescing that all into that ejaculation. That's right. And that's true for the women's egg as well. All the energy is pulled and totally concentrated in that egg for the perfect, perfect child to happen. But to play with that, I mean, to not uh, to talk about that then, if we're not ejaculating, if we're pulling that vital energy back into our bodies, talk about the Taoist. Well, let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about that. Trying to, uh, trying to talk about the idea of non-ejaculating and orgasm is kind of also trying to tell a woman not to menstruate. It's kind of the same thing, saying if you can, you can conserve your energy if you uh, don't menstruate as heavily as you do or even stop it in some cases. This is kind of some of the practices. And I'd like to get rid of that word, non-ejaculatory orgasm, even though as a Taoist, it's one of the fundamental things that we teach and train to do. But I don't like to use the word non-ejaculatory orgasms because we already then have a negative goal that we're trying to acquire. And for men who haven't achieved that, that experience, uh, it's always trying to stop something, trying to not do something. Does that make sense? Yeah, I like sense. to use the word seminal expansion. I like that. That what we're really doing is we're, <laughs> we're activating the little sperms to get ready to get on their journey. And we're expanding that energy 
And instead of having it go to the path of least resistance, which is outside of ourselves into creating a new life, that we can expand that energy with our mind, with our thought into our bones, into our shoulders, into our toes, into our fingernails. And all of a sudden that energy can be spread out within our body. And now we have a bigger container to handle our sexual energy. So we're, we're taking the same sexual energy and expanding it as a different experience in our system. And the question is, what do we do with that energy once it's that expanded? Because we're talking about a lot of energy at that point. We'll talk about that in another question. Yeah, yeah, we will talk about it, because that is part of the key. There's so much energy in the body. We need to reprogram ourselves on how to do, how to work with that. And the idea is we're giving life back to ourselves, as at least the male part, instead of going and making a baby, we're pulling it up into ourselves. And there's Taoist practices with breathing and all that that talk about how to do that. So we'll maybe begin into that. So Nick, from a, from a chemical, physiological, neurological perspective, um, talk about the physiology of sex. I think it's important to first establish that um, in most relationships where the woman says that she no longer has libido or interest in sex, or the man is finding uh, difficulty in, in focusing and enjoying the, the intimate act, we have to remember that the most important organ for sexual enjoyment and pleasure, bar none, is the brain. And women communicate at a much higher level and, and need to be communicated in an intimate fashion, in a loving fashion. And surprisingly, the most important word I could impart to you is innuendo. If you talk very blatantly to women, they get turned off. And if we're talking in terms of alluding to what's going to take place that night, the sex innuendo? acts- Innuendo? Is that- that's innuendo. 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 So, listen, I would like you to come tonight to see me. And during that time tonight, we're going to experience an amazing massage. I'm going to put some coconut oil and rub it all over your body now, tonight. <laughs> She'll pick up the tone. You can send her a text about making sure that we're going to be on time or where we're going to meet. But the text doesn't explicitly get across the tone and the energy of the voice and the way in which that accesses the female's brain to start causing her to become wet just upon hearing your words. And if she knows that every time you're going to have an encounter, that contrary to the belief that one has to have the pressure to orgasm, that the man has done enough homework and read enough books and recognizes that the woman's sight of pleasure does begin with the brain, but once you've brought her to that high state of arousal, it'll be much easier for the couple to enjoy a mutual orgasm. It doesn't even have to be simultaneous, but my rule of thumb is you need to please your woman at least two, three, or five times before you even think about entering her during intercourse. Because the reality is the female clitoris has 8,000 nerve connections, more nerve connections than any organ in the body for pleasure. These 8,000 nerves connect to 15,000 other nerve connections that all tie back into the brain. So if you believe that with the power of sexy words, innuendo, and do not be so blatant and brass, but find out up to what level her interest or tolerance is in regards to what words turn her on, and as you're having sex, some women are highly auditory, talk to her in her ear, whisper to her fantasies, create stories. 85% of men and women fantasize during intimacy and sex. And in those instances, they report the highest level of satisfaction during those fantasies. Again, remembering that the brain is the number one organ to stimulate. And if you're ignoring the brain, your woman will not look forward to being with you. She'll be thinking about the bills she's got to pay and the children that aren't put to bed yet and all the chores that you haven't helped her with during the day. And of course, the sexy thing you can do is get that stuff out of the way for her, hire someone that will take care of those chores, and your woman is there to please herself, himself, and unify in a spiritual, magnificent orgasm that should happen 
every night or every morning. For men, it's every morning because usually men's hormone levels are at their absolute highest, namely testosterone, dopamine, which is the pleasure hormone. And of course, in the initial attraction, there's pheromones to even attract that lady and PEA, phenylethylalanine, that's love at first sight hormone. There's been actual studies where they took a glass wall and separated people, and they'd have a lady come in on one side and a man on the other. They had a notepad next to them, and they were asked simply to jot down the very first thought that came to your mind when you saw her walk in or he, she saw you walk in. And they drew the blood at the time shortly after they jotted down the note. And what they noticed was some people actually went so far as to say, I don't know what it was, but the first thought that came to my mind was love at first sight. I mean, I saw her and I just... I had this weird feeling of love just looking at her. And it wasn't pheromones because they were separated by a glass wall. So something about the sight for many women turns them on, or a man. And it may be a look, it may be a look of confidence because women look for men that are confident. They don't want to be with a wimpy man that can't uphold his side of the relationship. That doesn't mean that you have to be pushy and aggressive, but he needs to be loving and caring and dominant from a standpoint of she looks forward to being with this man that cares so much about her that he's learned how to please her with a minimum of one hour of oral sex a night, followed by possibly a Hitachi vibrator, which is on all fours, and you enter her from behind, and then you finally come after she's come 12 times. Oh, thank and you. Trust me, she won't thank be thinking about sharing. chocolate. She won't be thinking about chocolate or shopping. Okay. She'll be thinking about being with you that night. That, that, that's good. I'm like, okay, uh, any volunteers? <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, we'll follow up with that. Yeah. I mean, not me, but somebody. Okay. Um, <laughs> Lisa is Lisa is somebody who really knows how to experience pleasure, and I would love to hear what really happens to you as you expand into those pleasure zones. Sure. The neurochemical part of sexuality is natural. And it's actually a system that wants to be active all the time. But we have another system that shuts it down when we want to be productive. Obviously, we live in a very product productive-oriented society, so we end up shutting down most of the time. What you're saying, our sexual um, physiology is always activable, activatable. Yes. When we go to sleep, we turn off the production and it just happens. Through sleep, we go through stages of arousal all night long. It's what our body would naturally do if we stayed in a relaxed place. So if you think about all the benefits of meditation, you know there's obviously lots and lots of studies about that. The centering, the way it stops all the stress systems in your body and helps them evacuate. If you have a um, sexual experience that is not goal-oriented, because once you're in the goal-oriented mode, you're back to the producing thing, then you can have all those benefits of meditation plus all those pleasant hormones that get triggered when you're in sex. So I think you all have experienced this. You know when you're starting to get excited, there's the initial endorphins and adrenaline that start to cause all the engorgement, the deeper breathing, the racing heart. Um, and then if you bring yourself to relaxing so that all of that can spread, and then you focus on particular sensations. Like what? So as um, Nick just mentioned, the clitoris is great because of all of its many, uh, all of its many nerve endings. Definitely on the frenulum of the cock, which you know that's at the very top, right around up to the urethral canal to where you get to the corona, right at that top place. That's where there's the most sensitive spot on the cock. Either the clitoris or the cock. Also, once the vagina is fully engorged, then you can access a lot of wonderful nerve endings there. The G spot is the root of the clitoris inside. It doesn't really matter which of the many wonderful spots you choose. What matters is that if you have all of your attention there, then the electrical conductivity of the skin in that point increases. Mm. Just like when you touch your, your iPhone or your iPad and you 
touch it deliberately, your finger can send, send the signal. It's because when you get deliberate, you increase the electrical conductivity. The same thing with the person who's touching you. So if you're putting all your attention on one spot, and the person who's touching you is putting all their attention on their finger, then together the electrical conductivity increases, your sensation intensifies, and if you, the more relaxed you stay, you can bathe yourself. It just becomes this bath of the circulating hormones, and the more you relax and don't tense up, the more those sensations can start to build in your body. Can you talk about your personal experience? Because as you do this sexual practice of engorgement, do you find yourself going to deeper and deeper levels? Yes, yes. Um, like so. So, for example, today my partner George here and I had our normal session, and it was <laughs> not normal. It was. Um, it's so fun. Every every several months, there's a new level that we reach, and today happened to be one of them. What happened? So what happened? <laughs> sure, yes. So um, there, as so, we just go straight for the clitoris because it's for me it's where the engorgement starts. So as um, he's stroking my clitoris, I relax deeper and deeper, and I could feel my body wanting to go into contractions, and I could tell that if I followed them there would be a rush of hormones all at once. And so I just relaxed more deeply, and all the sensations that I get during an over-the-edge over orgasm started coursing through my body, the electrical tingling, the pulsing, the, except for I kept relaxing deeper and deeper as though somebody had injected me with, the, um, with a drug you know, that paralyzed me. And he increases intention and he could tell what was happening because he's really attuned and listening to my body. So he kept stroking and pausing. And then it happened again. And this time it was inside of my vagina where there was all of this extra tingling spreading over my body. And again, I didn't allow any contraction so that the sensation of the orgasm just kept flowing over me. And there was no ending because that final hormone, most people when they go over the edge have a final hormone that starts contractions which squeeze out the engorgement and also causes kind of this resting phase. Um, now some people have other kinds of orgasms where they have less of that hormone released and then they like to have multiples mm -hmm. of those, but the more you build engorgement, the more you end up releasing the one that kind of makes you calm down. So you were riding the edge of this thing, right? It wasn't riding the edge. I kept going over the then, edge, except for that very, very last part that would have caused a whoo. And then happen. what happened? So it just kept <laughs> happening. <laughs> Is it happening now? <laughs> and the echoes of it are happening. Really? So Thank great. you. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but how did you end the session? Because don't you want just like more like that, more an hour? Yeah, so we just kept going and going, right? And then I thought, okay, so now what would it be like to have this experience while his cock is inside of me? Okay, what was that? Like? So, that, so that was the next step. I asked okay. him to come inside of me. And um, so then he he's very generous. I was not planning to be this graphic. That's okay. Um, We're with friends and family. Yes. But he, he likes to be able to stroke my clitoris while he's inside of me. And he has an amazing ability to feel because he's done a lot of Vipassana meditation focusing on nerve endings all over his skin. So his cock can feel the tingling coming from my vagina and clitoris going into his cock. So he can feel each peak. Um, and that I'm is the only yeah. and this this is not hard. Um, I <laughs> I don't think that was a pun. <laughs> when I um, when I started this practice of just learning to relax and feel, relax and feel, go deeper and deeper, I had no idea what was going to be the benefits. Behave yourself, Nick. <laughs> and it's. Um, when the first time came that he came and I felt his vibrations transferring into me, I just was shocked. 
So it's not like I've been trying. It's simply mm -hmm. that I just learned to relax and feel, relax and feel, relax mm -hmm. and feel. That it, and each time it just gets better and better. I don't want to be vicarious, but what happened when he was inside there oh, yeah, and, so, and doing all this thing? So then he, his cock was going to particular sensitive points inside of me, which triggered another bunch of those sensations going over and over. And um, then at one point, the, there was an extra set of hormones released that, and I relaxed deeper so that um, the tingling went like, not just over my skin, but in my blood vessels. Mm -hmm. So so then I was doing that and then... Um, Were you screaming? Was I wet? Oh, but what was your reaction? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I was moaning. You were moaning, yeah, okay. Moaning. Just checking. Um, so then finally I could feel like, we hadn't done the all the way down, but we had come down farther. Mm -hmm. And then he did a final few strokes and these deep contractions from another set of muscles started squeezing on him and he could feel that and the sensation transferred into his body. And then at that point, uh, we just both felt like this is this is great. <laughs> we relaxed. Okay, let me take down. a breath now. <laughs> and is that was that? Is there more? Yeah, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I need a moment. No. <laughs> thank you. No, really, I know it's a personal thing, and thank you. Thank. I mean, that. But that's that's beautiful. I, I'm just grateful because it's a practice of opening. Both of us being willing to fully open our bodies to each other, and it requires knowing that we can trust each other and that it's okay to just be totally vulnerable and mm -hmm. open. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> George, George, you have anything to add? Or? George, 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 take the mic, George. George do you, anything uh, about? I can't uh, add anything to that. Those you can't. It was beautiful. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, we'll get back to George. <laughs> Jamie. Uh, Yes, hi. Uh, do you want to talk about, well, all that, but adding your piece of dance and movement and how that brings the body into that kind of state? So this would be the sensuality part of sensation. And using uh, intuition really came home to me, um, hearing the other panelists speak. And when you were looking to either create your own or someone else's sensual um, ecstatic charge, really tapping into intuition. And and while I love, Nick, that you gave a procedure because some people need that. Some people need like step by step, this is how you make someone come a lot, you know? Um, but at the same time, I think an even more powerful tool is tapping into um, intuition as to, okay, um, let's bring this here, let's modify this here, let's try something new. And again, the trust piece was so, so important, um, especially if you're with a new lover or a new partner and you don't really know them and they don't really know you, there's not gonna be that physical opening as much for the woman. Um, so really getting to, to trust, to use your intuition when exploring and, and yourself as well and listening to your own needs um, and trusting your partner. And yeah. trust, and, and but, but opening a relationship enough that you can develop honest trust with your partner. So how do you bring dance and movement and all the things yeah. you do into that? Yes. So what I do with orgasmic dancing is therapeutic healing through sensual movement to release patterns, drama, um, judgment from the past, calling the future your desires, and to become more present in your body. So that's about sensuality, and dance is just one avenue, but when you step into another level of sensuality, you're actually activating your turn-on um, in a whole other way. Turn-on becomes working out at the gym, you know, and you're doing crunches, and you're like, oops, I just had another orgasm, um, you know, or you're eating, or um, just the, the fabric that you're touching becomes very sensual. So the same thing with dance, you're in this orgasmic state where you're connecting with source or the universe or a higher power or whoever you want to um, call this this force moving through you but it really magnifies your state of being it magnifies your connection it magnifies your personal power but also bringing you into a more turned on state where everything can be a sensual or sexual interaction everything can be an interaction with spirit <clears throat> when you really become a turned on Person. But where's that boundary between sensuality and sexuality? I mean, because people talk about that. Well, I think that we touched upon.
upon this at the last panel for those who weren't here, it's a constantly evolving discussion because to me, I mean, if you want to define sensuality and sexuality as the same thing, then it is, but sensuality is typically perceived as something more like I'm being, I'm touching my body and I feel very sensual, I'm getting a massage, which is sexuality is typically programmed in society as intercourse or cunnilingus or something where it's an actual physical sexual act. But if I sat here and started orgasmic dancing and rubbing my body, I think that you'd probably all agree it's pretty sexual, but also If you sensual. want to ask, yeah. we'll, we'll let you know. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, we'll think about that one. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm sure you'd, we'd all love to see that. Um, you can go to my website and check out my videos, orgasmicdancing.com. And you do that on YouTube. On YouTube, Dance and touch yeah. yourself. And, you well, I, I don't necessarily, it's not like I'm doing a strip tease, but no, there no, is. No, no, but you're showing people how to get in touch with their sensuality. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, how to dance and to be in your body in an orgasmic state. I had it, and I also do a performance class and one-on-one -on -one coaching so that we can heal ourselves through being sensual, through moving our body, through feeling without having to think, to take that mind element out, that programming out of the, out of the, the head. Yeah. No, I think that's important. Mm. And also that we can be sensual without having to be sexual. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. and there there is a line, and and it, I don't think it really is even important whether what is sex and what is sensuality, because um, whatever it is, it's a connection with your senses on a heightened level. Right, and sexuality is kind of like the heightening of that sensual physiology. So, yeah, so you so, can see it that way. Yeah. I mean, that's one way to see. It. Yes, absolutely. Should we talk yeah. to a, a pleasure yeah. expert? as she calls herself? Pleasure coach. Pleasure coach. So we're talking on the panel here about the physiology of sensual, sexuality, really. What happens in the body that um, may be different, or what is activated, or what have you noticed, or how to heighten that? Uh, do you have anything to add? Physiology, do I have anything to add? I'm just trying to keep myself grounded because I'm feeling it all. Um, I was the last one here, so as each panelist spoke about the physiology, it was passing down my way and my, my whole body was taking it in. So I was doing all the practices, breathing, prana, staying grounded, you know, putting my yoni on the chair down into the earth. Um, so, wow, I have so much to say. I'm just listening for which aspect. Um, of course, my situation is a little different because, as you know, I had a kundalini awakening. So you want to talk about that? Just briefly, yeah. just briefly, because that's a whole other panel. But. Um, um, the, the natural life force that is in all of us, the Shakti, the, the Mother Earth energy and the intelligence of di the divine lives in the base of our spine and each and every one of us. And we all have access to being able to tap into that, open it up and, and have it flow through our chakras, up, up our body um, and really enlighten and open us to all that we can be. Um, me personally, I wasn't expecting to do it, and when it happened, um, I was doing yoga and chanting and having a wonderful LA lifestyle, thinking, you know, this is great, and then I had the spiritual awakening. My nervous system wasn't prepared for it, so I did suffer for a number of years having all kinds of um, motor symptoms and um, parasympathetic symptoms and all kinds of things. It's been quite a journey, but for me, that also really propelled my sexual awakening because um, it is all the nervous system, and I agree with everything everybody said. It's all sex, um, and it's all sensuality. It's all life force. It's all chi. So for me, I was always very sensitive, always. But then you add the kundalini awakening to it, and uh, it really just addresses every aspect of your system. So I basically say, I call it the five bodies of consciousness, the um, energetic, emotional, physical, psychological, and um, spiritual. And so obviously my spiritual aspect was really open or I wouldn't have had the Kundalini awakening, but um, what really needed to come along was the physical and the emotional and the psychological aspect. And so um, for me, having sex is quite the journey. It is- In what way? <laughs> <laughs> I, first of all, I was always sensitive to begin with, and then you add the force of Kundalini and um, I mean, I jokingly used to say I have a magical pussy because men are attracted to it, but they don't know how to stay in it. <laughs> and, and I would short circuit a lot. What um, does that mean? So I'll try to be more specific. Yes. I, I literally, during sex, it would feel wonderful. But you know, I was coming from old school, like, you know, parts fit and you're, you're moaning and it feels good and you think you're supposed to take it. But I hadn't learned a lot of things like eye gazing, breathing, relaxing, not contracting, trusting myself, speaking up. 
um, trusting my partner more. And so as all this was happening, I would, I would kind of have a good time and take it and feel good. And then the next two days, I would wake up and I would have what I call sex hangovers. I would just feel, and I didn't drink, it wasn't drink, it was that the energy didn't move properly through me. Right, I actually want to talk about that in the next round, I mean, but that's good, the the, the nervous system and sexuality, um, how, and because people do get, you can't get burned out if you just become at it all the time. It, 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 oh, I wasn't at, no, that yeah. wasn't it, I was not at it all the time, I was very selective, but when when I was with a partner, that's, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I, we'll talk about your story later. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> someone uh, I, I but but yeah, what what I discovered was <clears throat> generally, I mean, we all need more education. And naturally, we know how to do it. We know how to run energy. We know how to be connected to the divine. We are so far off our access, being told what sex is, being told what is supposed to be, how we're supposed to be together, that the parts fit and you do it and you finish. And a lot of the times, men think, "Oh, well, I made her come," and then he'll say. Now can I now can I go at it? It's like, well, gee, if that's all you want, you know, one round and then a come and we're done. There's so much more there. But I've discovered so much in my research that you know men want the same thing as us. They want it to last. They want to be tender. They want to be in their heart time. They want as to well give women pleasure. Time. Yes. But they also want they they want to connect to the divine. They want. Mm -hmm. they, you don't have to call it um, non ejaculation or full body orgasm. It you know there was a reason why everybody wanted to touch the hem of Christ's garment. That crusted energy is a very sensuous sexual energy. It's connected to life force. We all crave to be um, enlightened and open and connected. And right. so we had just been doing it for so long in a way that was so unconscious, it was hurting us. And I just happened to be a bigger reflection of the collective unconscious. Right. No, I think that's a good point because we disconnected from that life force, which yeah. is sexuality, and that's what's been repressed, and that's why we're out of touch with our bodies. And, and that's why and we're nature. studying and doing yeah. so many play shops and workshops and yeah. panels because we're finding our way back to mm -hmm. what it is to just be in our natural state. Okay, let's go through the panel one more time, and then we'll take questions. Um, but let's talk about this ability to sort of direct and control. I mean, Lisa and I know Anton and Layla kind of use that, but how can we work with our nervous system mm, and, and to access, you talked about the spiritual realms, and but you know, we're not just here to have pleasure, we're here to do something with that and exchange and open actually orgasmic energy into a bigger field. So talk about like the nervous system and directing it and expansion. All right, so uh, very quick intro to Tantra would be that the tantric goes, a lot of people think of it as a sexual path, but they were actually very, very interested in energy. So they looked at the human body as what, how can you get a lot of energy into the body? How can you store energy in your body? And then what do you do with that energy? So it's interesting because just as our external political situation, our global situation, we're having an energy crisis that people don't know where to get clean, clear energy to save the planet Earth, it can be the same thing in our human bodies that we're often very used to as human beings running on dirty energy. So we're running on anxiety, we're running on fear, we're running on stress, we're running on overdoses of caffeine. We put our systems through this really intense process. And the ancient tantrikas looked at, okay, why aren't you already awake right now? If you have the choice to live as love, if you have the choice to be so filled with orgasmic bliss right here, right now, if you have the choice to know that you are divine in your heart, why do you ever choose anything else? Why do you ever live any other way? And the short answer to them, the shortcut answer, was most people are just severely energy depleted. They're using the energy in their system to harbor old wounds, emotional baggage. There's a lot of blockage in the human energy system. And nowadays, people just aren't used to living their fullest potential. So the tantric has looked at, okay, how do you get more energy into your system? And one of the easiest, cleanest, most natural sources of energy is our sexual energy. So they looked at it as the most massive gift. It would be like discovering you know, a natural way to fuel every single thing on our planet that was clean, easily accessible, and cheap. It's the same exact thing with sexual energy. So when we actually harness our sexual energy, when we use it not as something to um, just deplete our bodies or to get really sexually excited and then have 
um, quick orgasms. Or as a drug to distract us. Or as a drug to distract us, but actually as one of the greatest gifts we've been given. So all of these sensual experiences that everyone else on the panel has been talking about, you can actually use that sensuality as a form of energy. And once you actually start to collect that energy, you can move it through the body. And so most of you have probably heard about the chakra system since you're here at this expo. And what the ancient tantrics were getting at wasn't some kind of pretty colored wheel system inside the body. They actually realized through an experimentation that by focusing on different parts of the body, you can actually access different parts of your brain. So it wasn't just about activating Manipura chakra or Anahata chakra. They were actually saying, if you focus on certain parts of your body, you can activate different areas of the brain and actually tap into resources that you didn't previously know that you had as a human being. So one aspect of that is to tap into unaccessed potential, but another aspect is when you're living fully, when you're energetically full, life is inherently meaningful and magical. So you don't have to look outside of you for the right job, the right relationship, the right drug, the right experience, the right amount of money to feel deeply fulfilled inside. So Tantra was a science of how do you do that? How do you safely and in a grounded way access that capacity of your nervous system? And as, yeah, and really quick, just to, Alan love that. <laughs> Just to add, because we were acting about asking about the quality of the nervous system, that um, it, most of these systems, so one of the reasons I like to work with a Taoist system or a tantric system, is simply because they worked with human bodies for thousands of years. So they figured out what works, what supports people in this process. So kundalini energy, it's easily accessible right now at this time on the planet. I see people wake up in a single class. Right? And in classical texts, it was supposed to take hundreds of years to, to be able to activate this energy. And right now, if you breathe the right way, you can do it right now. So self-care is actually the next level of spiritual awakening because it's actually really easy right now to turn yourself on sexually, to turn yourself on energetically. And so in ancient Tantra, they looked at the qualities of this energy. And sexual energy, kundalini energy, has a hot quality to it. It has an airy quality to it. And the way that you balance that in your nervous system is through what's called ojas, which is code for unconditional love. So there's no reason to be doing these practices if you are not responsibly ready to love yourself completely. So the big danger that happens with kundalini, with activating yourself sexually and doing these practices, only happens if you're not willing to step up and love yourself so intensely and take care of your body and your psychology so much that it can handle this nervous system awakening. Can I just testify to that? Thank you so much, because that is exactly what happened when you know my Kundalini awakened. It was huge, unexpected. I wasn't in a place to psychologically, emotionally, even physically support myself. And now I see the grace and beauty and intelligence of it. And I wish I would have known someone like you 10 years ago, but it's been a journey and I can totally testify to everything you just said. Thank you. Yeah. And the fact that we have this accessible now is a, is a real treat for everyone and that we're open about our sexual energies and how we uh, can use the ancient text. So I hope you talk a little bit about directing that energy and, and the value of it in our spiritual evolution. Sure, so um, wonderful. Gosh, everybody's just brilliant. And I'd like to talk about from the Taoist perspective, because that's the perspective I come from. Uh, when we talk about Kundalini, we have something similar in the Chinese. So maybe let's, because we said this word a lot, and it's good to clarify. So Kunda means stillness, representing water. Lini means serpent, or line going upward. So you'll usually see imagery of Kundalini represented as a serpent intertwining and going upwards. And you'll also usually see two very distinct colors, one blue color and one red color. In the Chinese perspective, we equate kundalini to kan and li. Kan meaning water, associated with the kidneys, which in the Chinese medicine theory is sexual energy. Water is sexual energy in the Chinese system. Blue is the color of the kidneys. In contrast with the heart, which is the color red, associated with the emotions and mental energy. And fire. The, fire, a fire element. So we have fire element 
and water element. And the Chinese basically looked at sexual energy as a way to live as long as possible. They basically perceived or they described death as a process of dehydration. In other words, we either dry out from all the heat, exhausting, so our brain loses its fluid, we lose our mental function, our skin begins to wrinkle from dryness, or our water begins to drain out of our body. So anybody who's had an experience of an elderly parent or caretake of somebody elder, they can't hold their fluids anymore. The water just seeps out of them. So they looked at death as a process, a simple process of dehydration. And they looked at the idea of uniting water energy, which is representative of sexual energy, with fire energy, which is the heart and the emotions. How do we bring these two energies together so that the fire does not extinguish or extinguish the water and the water does not extinguish the fire? And it was a brilliant formula that they, they thought of. They, they thought of love or fire, instead of staying above in the system, being brought under the sexual energy, which is a water energy, and there being a metaphorical cauldron in between, so that you have the fire or the love or the emotions or the mental energy under the fire, under, under the water, the water is beginning to steam, and as you know, it's water because it's not extinguishing one another, as the water steams and it reaches a certain height, what happens to the water? It falls back into the cauldron. So we have this idea, this, this, uh, this metaphor of steaming the sexual energy, air conditioning the body with the sexual energy, with the cool energy of the sexual energy and the heart energy. And we have the whole formula for, for the esoteric systems that are presented in the Taoist system. So just, it, that's a one idea. One, one last idea I wanted to say is a famous uh, creator of family constellations. Anybody know what family constellations is? Bert Hellinger in Germany. He created this wonderful poem that st started off, and it's just a simple line. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is wise. And that sentence means to me that the body has its own intelligence. It has its own intelligence to survive, to reproduce as a species. I, I do not believe that we will ever have the intelligence to figure out the body's messages or what the body is trying to say. But I do believe that we have the awareness and the ability to be able to look and observe what the body is saying. I love when Lisa said, I started to feel those contractions and I chose not to go with it. Did you hear that? It's beautiful. The body in its own wisdom began its own motion of an orgasmic response that naturally leads to the reproduction of life. But because we are aware human beings, we can take hold of those responses by becoming aware of them and we begin to play with them. We can't stop them, but we can certainly spread them out. We can kind of dissect them on a table and observe them piece by piece. And little by little, we can take over the entire nervous system by observation and awareness alone. And direct it to healing. And direct it to whatever we want to direct it. If you want to buy a new car with it, you can do it. If you want to heal a body, you can do it. It's really anything you want to do with that energy that's now transformed into, instead of making babies now into a source of power and charisma or thought, or wherever you want to bring it. Very nice. Thank you. Nick. Go ahead, go jump into the physiology. No, I mean, we want to, because you have formulas, uh, aphrodisiacs, and um, other tools that will actually help part of the de depleted energies or add to it. And so talk about assisting the physiology and the nervous system if you, if you want to go in that direction. If you want to have the ultimate experience on a daily basis, I think we have to recognize that in, in this day and age, Although in 1953, the Kinsey Report showed that only 3% of women, uh, young females, had enjoyed oral sex. And it's interesting when you look at pornography and we represent through intercourse that these women are screaming and the whole thing. In reality, a woman who's orgasming usually is quite into moaning and sedate and into her body at that moment and expressing the deepest level of pleasure that emanates to her partner. And I really appreciate what Lisa had to share with you because I think that represented a, a real experience, particularly how she recognized the importance with her partner to, to be open enough to let him touch the most sensitive part of her body and open herself up and get into the experience. I think that um, 
when you look at Chinese medicine 3,000 years ago, um, I think they knew so much more than we do. In fact, when you compare that we use uh, literally a derivative of horse urine to give females uh, estrogen, and it doesn't even come from a female horse. And I want you to appreciate that they actually used to extract young female human hormones from the urine and dry it, and they would give it to the older females to rejuvenate their body with over 100 different hormones. Now listen closely, the men would receive hormones from young males who were at the peak of their health. They would dry it and they urine. would use urine. urine and they would deliver over 100 hormones from growth hormone to PEA. I mean, literally so many hormones, you couldn't even name all the hormones that the current hormone doctors work with three or four. So you're a vitamin company, I won't ask you, but um, what, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, I take that into account and when I create formulas, I look at, you know, what are the natural herbs? What are the supplements that actually manifest the ultimate in potential pleasure because I tend to believe that if you can manifest incredible energy as we speak of energy as a feeling of high degree of sensory awareness and pleasure that that same energy can be accessed during the sexual process during a lecture during your work because enthusiasm everyone's attracted to enthusiasm and joy and excitement and the reality is it's not just during the sexual act so what I do is I focus on how do you move out of the body xenoestrogens and chemicals and toxins, the over 57,000 chemicals that you're all exposed to every day that weren't even available 3,000 years ago. And I've looked at the science and I've discovered through doing 24-hour urine tests on tens of thousands of men and women and doing their blood tests and, and their uh, saliva tests. And then I compare that to, to their state of health and what their diet is and so forth. So, I do this because I know that if a couple is really wanting to enjoy the magnificence of probably the ultimate pleasure that we all share in common, that is that when couples tell me they have sex once a week or once a month, that's the national average. As you get older, the ability to engage in intimacy drops dramatically, and so does the connection between the two. I think personally that sex is the spark and the sizzle in relationships. And I, I wrote a book that's coming out for my uh, anti-aging clients to that effect. But I, I think that you have to have unconditional love. I think you have to learn that within the process of, of love that the higher level of sex is all about love and spirituality because you become one. It's the one time during your day where you're hopefully present and you're in the moment and you're explosively experiencing this incredible pleasure with your partner. And I think that far too often we get worried about whether the couple is in a goal-oriented situation when in reality, the natural state of sex is not something we're taught. We're not taught how to bring a woman to orgasm or more importantly, a woman to understand the timing of the man. They all think men are pigs and all they want to do is jump on them and screw you. And, and to a degree that seems that way, but the reality which you don't understand women is men reach a certain, certain hormonal peak very quickly. And if they're centrally uh, stimulated by your sight or you bend over, you do something, you smile, you do something and you're thinking, God, he just started massaging me. Next thing you know, in three minutes, he's wanting to screw me. And the reality is, yes, he is because at that moment, it's that critical moment that his hormones have reached his peak and he's getting his erection naturally. He's not taking Viagra. He's doing what, what comes natural to him. But the couple has to be retrained. Yeah, but what do you, you say to men who, who are like that? I mean, how do you redirect their you, focus? You completely help the man to redirect and learn. How? Through timing and through education and to recognizing it's okay. Don't worry that an hour from now after you've massaged her and you've pleased her and you've done certain things that are extraordinary for her that that energy will come about, but that's where supplements come in too, because timing in nature was designed that the man would jump on the woman as quick as possible to procreate and get onto the next. And so if, if you have to overcome nature as the way we are programmed in a woman- Because the wild animals would come if you- uh, Yeah, of course. Quick at it, <laughs> and in fact, in male monkeys, they line up about 20 at a time, and the female is one after another, and the dominant male will ejaculate the greatest amount after he sees the pleasure she's going through. The dominant male will ejaculate and will impregnate her. So the reality is the one with the highest testosterone will always impregnate the female generally. So in, in, in the history of our origin, if we believe that the noblest monkeys are 94.6 genetic match, and they please and they touch each other and they caress, and they don't just have sex and intercourse, they, they have bisexuality, they have all kinds of things that are going on that's not always just intercourse.
but but they're the love monkeys that we come from they would if a warring monkey comes from another tribe to approach the new tribe they don't send out another alpha male to fight him they sent out three females to caress and coo him and make love to him and he totally loses interest in fighting so 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 send this to your politicians because war should never exist if they weren't so frustrated and they don't understand sex and enjoy having to stick a cigar a cigar in you or something versus something that makes a difference in humanity and love because if there's more love in this world we wouldn't have war thank you okay uh lisa thank you nick I don't know how you're going to top what you already left us with, but um, I don't know how we can get deeper into it. It's not about the goal, it. remember? It's not about the goal. So why don't you talk about maybe how other people can just really open up and explore their own physiology. I, I like that, in that relaxed state. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, well, in that case, the, I'd like to just strike this down because this is a perfect exercise. Um, and just tying it into spirituality, so we'll do these kind of simultaneously. Um, you know we're all awake. We're just doing stuff to put ourselves to sleep. <laughs> as soon as we stop doing those things, we realize we've always been awake. The things we're doing are pretending that we have it together, we have a goal, we think we know where we're going, we're pretending we're separate, we think we have our individual motivations. Meditation is about letting that go and seeing what arises. And the, in sexuality, when you're truly going for pleasure rather than a goal, you do the same thing. You enjoy the peaks and the valleys like we do in life. We enjoy the peaks and the valleys when we stop putting that other template on that puts ourselves to sleep. Okay, so how does that, how do you start on that process? And obviously you're here, you're already on it, but um, I'm gonna strike this and when we can change into pure awareness, which is we're just receptive to everything coming into us because the universe is always guiding us. So when I strike this, just notice for how long you can hear it. And then we'll switch and I'll show you how you apply that to something central in your body. Now you just felt some of your body begin to relax as you listened. You felt some of your agenda drop away. And you found that you couldn't necessarily find the exact end of your awareness. You can try to find where's that boundary of my awareness. And it's, there's not a line because we are one awareness. <coughs> now when you get touched, so here I'll just do, I have my model. Oh, or maybe we can get a volunteer if you want. Okay, so oh, well, when I'm teaching, I, no, I have... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I, I brought this because you said bring my things for my class. When yeah, I saw you on this is your. Okay, so. This so is your vagina. This, I'm showing how you do just a very deliberate touch. And mm. so you imagine you prepare what you're going to touch by first making sure your hand is awake. You're feeling all the nerve endings on your fingertips, you're feeling all the nerve endings on your palm. You're just fully awake and aware in your hand. And the person receiving is doing the same thing with their genitals. On that moment of contact, you just feel all that electrical sensation. And now you move towards the first place you're going to touch as a stimulating touch. So the stimulating touch will be on the clitoris. 
as you move towards the clitoris by now everything's ready everything's awake you've just waking everything up very deliberately and then imagine just like I struck the gong you put your finger down to that first up down stroke and pause you can do this to yourself or with a partner and just pause and feel how far into your body can you feel that sensation? The more you relax, the more it moves through your whole body. And again, you're letting go of your agenda and you're allowing the natural up and down. It's the exact same thing you do in meditation and it's the exact same thing we do when we take that template off and we allow ourselves to be awake. It's our own template that is struggling to make life look a certain way. But when we wake up, we're in awareness that the universe is in a perfect flow that goes up and down. And we don't try to make the downs up. We don't try to make the ups down. We enjoy the up and down. So with each stroke, you just do that exact same thing. You can add a second stroke or a third. And in that same process, you're just opening and receiving and allowing yourself to be pure awareness. Thank you, beautiful. Okay, we actually don't have that much time. We have to be out here at 4.15, but let's go ahead, Jamie and Keila, please um, talk about going deeper into your experience as a sensual sexual being. So, when you're moving, you're moving the energy. We're, we're all processing a lot of energy right now. We're going through a lot. Um, where, if you want to call it awakening, or we're already awakening, just remembering that, or we're letting go of the things that are stopping us from being our full self. Um, when you're moving, you're literally moving the energy through your body. You're transmuting it. You're releasing the patterns. You're releasing the energy blockages. You're releasing the programs of who you thought you should be because someone once told you so. Um, so my one of my biggest um, uh, ways to do this is through movement, even if it's just uh, a, a swing of the hips. It's about moving that energy with intention, just like doing everything in your life with intention. So I will. Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank oh, well, you. people can talk to everyone after the panel. But yes, yes. Keila. Um, I'm just going to touch on a couple of quick things that okay. I um, felt compelled to share, and, and we can yes. close. Um, three things. Um, number one. Um, Kundalini is a blessing and it can be a very simple, beautiful opening. It does not have to be uh, huge and challenging. And I agree with what you said on the end of the panel there that we're at a time where um, it's we have much more access to it and it can open quite beautifully. I've witnessed people in my presence have a very lovely opening they weren't even intending to. So just don't be afraid of it. <laughs> and um, if you have any questions, you can always reach me. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is we were all talking about energy and self-love and care. and after living this experience for so long and really suffering on many levels, I finally realized, wow, it's so intelligent, it's so brilliant, it's so easy, there's such a flow, and um, just relaxing, learning to relax, which of course is hard to do when your system is circulating like the electricity of all of Manhattan through a 40 watt bulb, but um, I just wanted to say that sorcery, we're talking about alchemical um, al alchemy, and we're talking about moving energy and working with it, Sex is not localized to the genitals. Sex is the alchemy, sex is the energy, the steam, the fire, and the water, all of it. And so we are all sorcerers, and we are the source. So sorcery, think of it kind of like that. You source, and then you have your, your wand or whatever, the, the, the uri out there. I don't know what uri means, I'll look it up, but okay. sorcery. <laughs> and then the last piece is, um, Basically, I already touched on it, just that okay. it all really is on a perfect So point. before we finish, I'd love to just um, have sex with the audience, so sense. But, no, but if we on the panel, I've never done this, we can experiment. If we could send that, because sex is you know, a giving and receiving, if we here could send that flow out to the audience, and you can activate your kundalini, and, and they could receive it somehow. Do you have any um, ideas about how they could receive that, Lisa or, or Jamie? And we just send that energy out then we can just have like a moment experience. Just re relax. Yeah. Oh, okay, Feel everyone your relax. feet on the floor. Open your legs and arms. Just unwind. Relax your legs, okay. your hips, 
Relax your abdomen, your heart, your chest. Relax your hands, your arms, your shoulders. Relax your jaw. Relax your eyes and open the top of your head. And now sink in to your genitals, allowing them to sink all the way into the earth. Gently push them, just gently relax them. And then take a deep breath. And bring your attention right into the nerve, nerves all through your genitals. And we're just going to send you energy. <laughs> they want to <laughs> sorry. Don't usually respond that quick. But <laughs> they said they have to get us out of here by 4.15. So um, let's just wrap up. This has been a really exciting panel, very informative. Thank you. I just tell, I'm Alan Steinfeld. I have a website, New Realities. I have lots of interviews with a lot of these people, sexuality, UFOs, consciousness, newrealities.com. And um, these people will be available after. This is Layla. Uh, orgasmicbliss.com or laylamartin.com, home of the sexy revolution. Go to sexyspirits.com. If you uh, just subscribe today, there'll be a download for a free class coupon that you can come into any of our classes for. Sexyspirits.com. Go to uh, Nick. PhD.com for the ultimate in sexual pleasure supplements. And if you'd like my script that I do for my clients every day where they listen and program it into the phone, we'll get you into a very sensual, aroused, energetic state. Go to um, growyoungandslim.com and just type in uh, your email for the newsletter to accept. And we'll send you a wealth of great support information. Thank you. And I'm Lisa Carrillo at Loving ourlovelife.com and uh, you can sign up for a newsletter that I send out about twice a month. And she gives classes in New York. Jane Summers and you can go to orgasmicdancing.com and just remember that all that you desire is within you. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Keela Malat, <laughs> signs just stop. Um, pleasureyourworld.com and keelascabaret.com. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, play shops, and I have, um, I'm also a performer with a one-woman show called How to Get Into My Pants, where I educate and enlighten through entertainment. So please feel right. free to come up and sign up on our Thank emails you. if you want. I'm doing another sexuality panel at the Meta Center on November 21st. You can go to metacenter.com or uh, newrealities.com. It's about sex, shamanism, and psychology. Thank you, everybody, for being here.